This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again here on Truth Frequency Radio 90.7 FM in Denver. Great to be back with you for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political analysis. It is truly your political brunch from hell, and we're we're glad to be with you once again the absolute polar opposite of the sleepy and boring Sunday morning political shows out there. This is not Face the Nation. This is not Meet the Depressed. This is In Your Face Political Radio. We're glad to be back with you here on Truth Frequency Radio. And we start off this week with the news that, oh yes, the gay mafia is at it again. The gay mafia has taken aim and they are attacking here again in the state of indiana so without further ado let's get to our official gay mafia theme Mafia is out in force telling us that we must boycott Indiana. No matter where you turn on television, radio, newspapers, magazines, certainly social media, you will not be able to avoid the words boycott Indiana. It's trending over in the Twitter sphere as we speak. And those two words are on the tongues of every hipster, every rock and roll star, every actor, every actress, every author, seemingly every journalist, boycott Indiana. All having to do with this uh, religious freedom law that was signed into to law a couple of weeks back. Not uh, taking into account, of course, that there are many other states, roughly half of the states in the Union, that already have similar laws. No one's really talking much about those laws. Because Indiana is the, the one that just happened to do it most recently, so we have to go after them. There are plenty of other laws out there. In fact, Connecticut's governor uh, just went off on this Indiana law and evidently didn't realize that his own state, Connecticut, has a similar law. But this has become the... Uh, cause of the week for the leftist crowd and they are just attaching themselves to it we're told this religious freedom law in indiana will just be such a horrible thing for gays and that it's incumbent on us and the rest of the country to boycott indiana put all kinds of pressure on them so that they'll reverse this law because if we don't if we don't boycott indiana if we don't put all the pressure we can from outside of indiana to convince them, to force them to repeal this law. If we don't do that, then, oh, golly, the gays out there are just going to be in tremendous trouble. It will practically be a new era of Jim Crow for the gays within the state of Indiana, or so we are told. That's how this is being presented to us. That's how the subject is being argued to us. That, by golly, if the rest of the country doesn't rise up and interfere in the business of the good people of the state of Indiana, then by golly, the gays out there will just be no different. 
than the African Americans in the South in the 1950s and 60s. It'll just be Jim Crow all over again. That's what we're being told. That's why we're being told it's incumbent on the rest of us who do not live in Indiana to rise up and meddle in their affairs. That's why we're being told that. But is that true? Is it true that this law that has just been signed would usher in an era of Jim Crow for gays within the state of Indiana? Well, I don't believe that it does. Because let's make one thing perfectly clear right now, and this is something that nobody wants to talk about. Nobody even mentions it. Nobody even breathes a word of it. If you are a business in the state of Indiana today and moving away for, for a moment from those businesses who might like to who might like to avoid serving gays or might like to discriminate, if you want to use that term, moving away from them for a moment, let's say you're a business who does not wish to discriminate. Let's say you are a currently existing business in Indiana who is fine with serving gays. Maybe you want to bake a, maybe you're fine with baking birth or, or wedding cakes for gays. Maybe you're fine with them eating in your restaurant. Maybe you're fine with, with serving them in whatever way, shape, or form that you do your business. Let's say you're one of those businesses. Well, if you're one of those businesses, you can continue doing just exactly what you're doing, even in the face of this law. This law does not prevent you from serving gays. And I would, I would wager, I would guess that the vast majority of businesses within the state of Indiana fall into that category. I would hazard a guess, although a somewhat educated one, that as we stand right here in April of 2015, most businesses in the state of Indiana currently serve gays and don't have a problem with it. Well, in the case of that majority of businesses, absolutely nothing in this law forces you to change anything. You can serve gays all you want to. No one's going to stop you from it. If you want to go out of your way to appeal to gays even, you can do that. Let's say you're a bakery. And let's say you run a special on gay wedding cakes you can do that nobody's stopping you from doing that today nobody's stopping you from doing that by way of this law so if you want to serve gays you still can but i want you to think about something if this law did not exist if those very few businesses in indiana who did not wish to serve gays for their religious reasons and i know people have different opinions on whether they should or whether they shouldn't but I'm not really going to go much into that. Let's say that those few laws, or those few businesses, I should say, those few businesses who don't wish to serve gays, let's say that this law did not exist. Let's say that they were forced to serve gays over and above their religious convictions, over and above their, uh, over to, and they're above their understanding of right and wrong, over and above their morality. Let's say that we force these businesses to check their religion at the door, check their morality at the door, check their moral compass at the door, and serve gays anyway. Who would be negatively impacted by that? Well, certainly, those businesses themselves, of course, would be negatively impacted because they're being coerced. They're being forced to engage in business actions that they do not feel are right and moral. Okay, so they would be, be impacted negatively. But there's another group of people that would be negatively impacted as well. And this is something that people generally don't think about, and they should. Let us say that I'm one of the majority of businesses, and I'm a business owner of one of those one of those businesses that currently serves gays in Indiana. And I'm doing this without any prodding. I'm doing this without any law. I'm doing this without anyone telling me I have to. I have taken the risk upon myself of appealing to gays. Let's say I've done that. And let's even go further to say that because I have taken it upon myself to appeal to the gay population, and maybe I've even put together a little bit of a clientele based off of that, maybe I've become the go-to baker for gay wedding cakes, for example. 
If that's the case, and now you go in and you force everybody else to serve gays as well, aren't you taking away an advantage that I've earned? Aren't you taking away an advantage that I put together for myself based on my own risk? And now you are introducing competition to the marketplace, competition to me that would not otherwise be there if businesses were able to function of their own volition? That hardly hardly seems fair to me. I'll tell you what, if I were, to use the example, if I were the owner of a bakery that made gay wedding cakes, I would be hacked off at this law. I would be mad. I would be angry. Because if businesses are allowed not to serve gays, or not to serve anyone else for that matter, I as a business owner can swoop in and say, hey, I know you're not being served by my competitor across town. I'll serve you. Bring your business to me. And maybe I can even carve out my own niche by appealing to that group of people. Maybe that's the niche I could carve out for myself for competition, for survival, for business. Now, make no mistake. I am not sympathetic to the gay agenda. I am not someone who agrees with homosexuality, but by the same token, I'm also not someone who really gives much of a hoot what people do in their bedroom. I disagree with it on a moral basis, I disagree with it on a religious basis, but if you stop and think about it, I could probably find a lot of things out there that I disagree with a lot of different people on in terms of morality and religion. This is just one of them. So I am not taking up the banner for the gay agenda, not by any stretch of the imagination. Not even close. But all I'm saying is that if you allow businesses to operate naturally, if you allow businesses to choose, if they desire to do so, whom they will deal with and why, If you allow businesses to do as they wish, then you also allow other businesses to come in and pick up market share from those that their competitors are choosing not to serve. And I got news for you, and this is something that a lot of people won't want to hear. Man, some people are going to be really angry at me when I I say this, what I'm about to say here. But when it comes to discrimination and so-called bigotry, economic competition, self-interest, and good old-fashioned greed has done far more in Western civilization to put the kibosh on bigotry, racism, sexism, and various other types of discriminatory behavior, good old-fashioned greed has done far more to make a dent in those concerns than government interference ever has. Good old-fashioned greed has gone a lot farther in terms of putting together a society where different types of people, be it different ethnicities, different religions, different economic classes, different genders, different sexual orientations, different whatever, can live side by side, mix among each other with very little issue. Greed, self-interest, and economic pursuit has done far more to foster that environment than government interference ever has. Oh, that's the dirty little secret. We all think back to the South in the 1960s and the civil rights movement and and how difficult that was for everybody involved. But did you ever stop to think about that same time period about University of Alabama football, one of the great college football teams in the nation at the time, and the college football team in the South? As Bear Bryant led, everybody else would follow down South in those days. Did you ever think about Alabama football? And did you ever think specifically about the integration of Alabama football? Because while the government, the federal government specifically, was busy 
passing laws and forcing people to integrate or trying to force people to integrate in their businesses and their schools and national guard troops came in and you had the water hoses and the dogs and all the rest well all of that was going on in alabama in the south at the time the Alabama Crimson Tide football team integrated without any National Guard troops being present, without the federal government ever having to step in and say, hey, you need you need to put some black players on your team. It all happened without the government needing to be involved. Why did it all happen without the government needing to be involved? Because there's a very famous football game between Alabama and USC that happened back in the 1960s where USC had a running back named Sam Bam Cunningham, an African-American gentleman who absolutely lit Alabama up and they beat him. And upon that day, Bear Bryant had the realization we can no longer compete nationally if we don't recruit the black athlete. With all white teams, yes, we will dominate the South, but we will never dominate the nation again. You will have seen the last national championship at the University of Alabama if we don't recruit black players. That's the argument that Bear Bryant made to the powers that be at the University of Alabama. So he started recruiting those black players. And Bryant, who with all white teams was already beating everybody in the South to begin with, now the other teams in the South, the teams in the Southeastern Conference, here, Tennessees and Mississippis and Floridas, Auburns, Kentuckys, those teams, no matter how reluctantly, knew that they had to start integrating their teams as well. Because if Bryant's already kicking your butt with all white teams, and now he's taking out he's taking out all the limits. He's, he's going after the black athlete. He's recruiting everybody, no matter who they are. Well, you've got no chance unless you keep up. And that integrated Southern football. It didn't take a federal government to do it. It didn't take a law to do it. It happened because of competition. It happened because of self-interest. It happened because of a man wanting to be on top. And it happened with nary an issue. Without the violence, without the ill feelings to the degree that other such integration took place in the South. So going back to our Indiana example, what happens if a business chooses to discriminate against gays? First of all, I don't think very many will. But if someone does, that gay person that they discriminate against, that gay person still has their money. They're still going to want their item or their service that they're wanting to purchase, and they will go somewhere else to get it. And that means somebody else will get that business. Somebody who was willing to, to serve the gay, we'll get that money, we'll get that business. And over time, if the business that discriminated does not change your ways, over time they most likely will go out of business. So in other words, the bigot gets punished in the end. What could be wrong with that? Because I tell you something, if you force that bigot, if you want to use that term, to serve the gays, yes, he's going to be mad about it, but he'll go ahead and do it. So you haven't changed his views. And he's still going to he's still going to treat that gay person badly, most likely. Just not in an overt way. So you haven't changed anything. And that's exactly what we saw happen in the South during the end of Jim Crow. Sure. You could you were being forced to, to serve whomever came in your door. That didn't mean that you still didn't talk about them. You still didn't think negatively negatively of them. In fact, it probably reinforced those negative feelings. The bottom line is that each of us, day in and day out, no matter who we are, no matter what we do, no matter what walk of life we're in, each of us, day in and day out, discriminates in some ways. The word discrimination has become a dirty word in America, and I don't think it need be. I don't think that's right. We discriminate each and every day in this country. If you're a father and your daughter, your teenage daughter, brings home a date who has a lot of tattoos and piercings all over him, mentions that he's had prison time, if she brings home that guy, you're probably going to discriminate against him. And well, you should. You're probably going to forbid your daughter to go out with him. And well, you should. 
Are you married? If you are, if you're a male and you're married, well, your wife discriminated against every other guy out there in order to marry you. And you have discriminated against every other woman out there to marry her. And it's a beautiful thing. Do we not discriminate each and every day on the basis of any number of characteristics, most of them very minor? Of course we do. If we didn't, we could not make decisions at all. But should the government be in the business of legislating against discrimination? No, I do not think so. Because simply put, there's no way to legislate against discrimination without also legislating against people being able to associate or not associate with whomever they want, whyever they want to, or wherever they don't want to. Instead, let people run their businesses, run their households, run their lives the way they want. And if a business doesn't want to discriminate, doesn't want to serve gays or anybody else, let them make that choice and let another business potentially benefit from that choice. All they're doing is taking themselves out of a, of a part of the competition. Now, some would say, well, in your scenario, what about if you're in a small town where none of the businesses want to serve gays, where everybody discriminates against? What, what do you do then? Don't you need a government entity to come in and correct that? I say no. Because look at that situation. If you are a gay person, and I'm, I'm, I'm straight, so I, don't, I can't really say that I can empathize with this too much, but just trying to put myself in their shoes as best I can. Let's say you're a gay person who does live in a, in a town where everybody would choose not to serve gays. Let's say that's the case. Then is that really the town you need to be living in anyway? Are you ever going to be happy in the town? If tomorrow someone came down and told everybody in that town that they had to serve gays, would your life suddenly get better in that town? Would people suddenly start treating you well? No, they wouldn't. In fact, their negative feelings towards you would probably be reinforced. And that enmity would be far more than it was otherwise. Your life, quite frankly, would, would most likely be a living hell. Whether or not the government forced someone to serve you, in fact, your life might even be more of a living hell if they were forced to serve you. Because now that's going to draw the battle lines. Whereas... In another situation, some enterprising business who's just struggling to survive would probably appeal to you and establish a relationship with you and make you part of their clientele because others are discriminating against you. Now that can't happen. And now those old feelings are going to be set in stone because there's no economic avenue with which to change them. You know, as I said earlier, I am not a person who agrees with the gay the gay lifestyle. I don't agree with, with the gay movement. But I'll tell you right now, if I were a baker, let's say, and I were in a, in a locale, in a, in a situation where I was not the top baker in town, if I was a young business, a new business, someone trying to scratch and claw and, and make my niche and, and, and get my – and put myself out there to survive – if I were doing that, would I bake a gay wedding cake? I very well might. I wouldn't agree with it. I wouldn't like it. But I might do it if if that's what I needed to do to survive. If I knew that the big guy across town who I'm competing with and who has all the advantages over me, if I know he's not going to appeal to the gays, I probably would. Because that's what I have to do to survive. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should do that. I'm saying that's what I would be tempted to do. I think business owners should be able to make their own decisions and, and operate within their own conscience, operate within their own religion. But I'm telling you that if you prohibited my competitor from that discrimination, then you are taking my opportunity to take market share away from him, which he is voluntarily giving up. You're taking that opportunity away from me. You're making it harder for me to survive as a businessman. But what's the upside to that? What is the upside to that? Let businesses make their own decisions 
let economic competition and let the free market sort it all out. Is this law in Indiana really Jim Crow? No, it's not, because the, the government is not telling you that you cannot serve gays. You still can. All it's saying is that if you don't want to serve them or anybody else based on a religious conviction, you don't have to. It's not... It's not setting up gay-only water fountains. It's not setting up gay-only lunch counters. So no, this is not Jim Crow. And although I truly believe that the civil rights legislation in the 1960s did go too far, that I do think they overstepped their bounds back then in terms of forcing businesses to accommodate everybody. I think that was a mistake, something we have not recovered from, and something that brings, frankly, that brings quite frankly, arguments like this to the forefront in 2015. Even though the civil rights legislation in the 1960s did go too far, I don't think we can legitimately compare what is happening in Indiana today to true Jim Crow. Because the state government is not forcing that segregation. There's no segregation at all, actually, other than voluntary segregation. So I stand behind Indiana. I won't boycott him. And I think laws like this are well and good. Let businesses make their own decisions. Let us all make our own decisions. That's the first segment, folks. It's in the books. We're going to come right back with that was the week that was here on Truth Frequency Radio. 